Everybody has a great story. Everybody in the audience has a great story. We're going to listen a little bit uh, to uh, these folks' story and uh, you know, ask, uh, ask them specific questions about how they uh, navigated certain aspects of living life uh, um, while having epilepsy, being treated for epilepsy. And then uh, at the end, we'll have like 15 minutes. We'll uh, open the, the uh, floor for discussions. Um, and you know, ask questions of uh, the speakers. Um, you know, some of which you know they may be able to answer, some of that they may not be able, to, some they may not be comfortable answering. Just please respect that. Um, and but uh, but everybody will be able to learn from each other's experience. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, the speakers. So what they're going to do is just. Hello. Yeah, perfect. So we're gonna start, uh, and they're gonna give a, a, a five minutes about who they are, uh, where they are in their epilepsy journey, how old were they? They started, uh, where they are in their life journey, and then we'll talk. Uh, uh, we'll let them each uh, speak a little bit, and then we'll uh, talk about specific topics. So maybe let's start over here with Al. Hi, everyone. Um, like Dr. Friedman said, I'm Allie or Alexandra. I am a patient of Dr. Davinsky's. I am 34 years old, a native New Yorker. Uh, I was born with a left hemisphere brain infarction or a stroke that occurred on or caused complications on the right side of my body. Uh, I was diagnosed when I was eight months. Um, the doctors had said that it happened during utero, possibly kind of don't know 100%. Um, diagnosed at eight months, the neurologist at the time had told my parents that I could be prone to seizures. Um, but at the time, I was going to start presenting with physical challenges, speech issues, and then when I got to school, academic challenges. Uh, so therapy as an infant um, started with PT, OT, and then speech. Um, went throughout my entire childhood and most of my adolescence completely seizure-free. Fast forward, um, first night of freshman orientation um, at college, I'm out with friends, having dinner, have my first seizure. Uh, over the next four years, I had three more, or sorry, two more, so two more subsequent seizures. Um, all of three of these seizures were stress-induced. They were partial seizures in which I lost consciousness um, and I had jerky movements on the right side of my body. Uh, at this time, Dr. Davinsky found the right medication for me, and uh, since then, I've been seizure-free for 11 years. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, in addition to medication, um, I do take very good care of myself. Um, I think that's really important, um, regardless of whether you know you're on medication and. Um, seizure free so I make sure I get an adequate an amount of sleep um, I eat three meals a day <laughs> um, I make sure that I don't um, uh, overstress myself and I try to plan for potential stressors if I can obviously that doesn't always happen um, but I try to um, I work part-time uh, so I, I really make sure that in addition to the medication that I'm also you know doing, um, making sure that I'm taking my taking care of myself in a natural way. I also um, will try to um, try not to be in environments um, with stimuli such as flashing lights that could obviously provoke a seizure. Um, but with all that said, even though I am seizure free, I do have regular panic attacks on a regular basis. Um, I have a lot of post-traumatic stress of having had seizures. Uh, and so if I feel a sensation um, or I feel lightheaded because I haven't eaten all day, or not eaten all day, or not eaten as much, um, my body goes to, oh no, am I gonna have a seizure? And I get very panicky. Um, I've learned to navigate these and mitigate them with techniques. I'm also on medication, um, but I don't think it, they will ever go away. Um, it's something that I just have to manage. Um, but with all that said, I did go on and I got my BA in speech language pathology. <laughs> Thank you. 
um, I went on and pursued graduate studies, and now I have my own foundation called Different Enable, which supports people with disabilities. Um, but with, again, all of that said, you know, I've had my share of bullying, more so when I was um, younger um, with my peers. I've faced academic discrimination. People have looked down upon me, you know, with my abilities. Uh, so it's not been a straight line at all. Um, it's a constant challenge. Um, but, you know, as a, a mid 30 year old woman, I, you know, I have a great group of friends who could care less that I have epilepsy, I'm very compassionate and supportive. Some of my friends even have epilepsy themselves. Um, and I live alone, I have a dog, I work out, I cook, I bake. So. Um, I'm living my life to the fullest, and um, but although epilepsy is a continuous challenge, again, like I don't, I don't let it stand in the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. So we're gonna get, you know, we're gonna go back to a lot of the things you've touched on, uh, especially, you know, since you're the the closest to to being a young adult uh, and going through college. You know, it's certainly an issue uh, that uh, a lot of people have on their minds. Uh, Richard. Next. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Richie, and I have a unique and very fortunate perspective. My seizures started at 22, out of nowhere, idiopathic. It was originally uh, stress-induced, and then it went from approximately once every three, we three weeks, complex partial, moaning, losing awareness for a minute or so and went from every three weeks after about three or four years uh, i was having 20 every month uh, again mostly complex partial a handful of generalized and a lot of uh, simple partial as well so over a period of 22 years um, i had over 3,000 seizures I was taking, at times, 15 pills a day. Um, <clears throat> every med from, this was years ago originally, was just Dilantin, and then uh, trial drugs before they were made public, and, and so on, drugs out of the country, and nothing worked. And so I'm first I'm gonna give you my epilepsy perspective, then I'll tell you how I navigated life. So. Um, for 22 years, 3,000 seizures, um, Dr. Davinsky had explained to me that no medicine will control my seizures, and they were in my right front temporal, so that's where a lot of our personality is located, it was going to change who I am, and I had a 10% chance of pseudo. He also suggested that I look into whether or not I'm a good candidate for surgery. And um, I did two weeks of inpatient testing to determine that I am a, or was a candidate. And um, 19 years ago, uh, on April 16th, um, here I had three, uh, it was two surgeries. I had electrodes implanted into my brain, closed me up. Um, it takes a week to get the readings to determine exactly where the seizures are coming from. And then a week later, after I gave them those seizures, they went back in and removed three inches in my brain. And in the 19 years, I've, I'm 100% cured, no side effects, never felt better. And I've been given the blessing that all these doctors and researchers are working so hard on to give us. So I'm very thankful for that. So that's my epilepsy journey from how did I handle it as an adult. So again, started at 22, came out of nowhere, I had no idea what epilepsy was. Uh, idiopathic, they don't know why. I was very athletic, I graduated from Syracuse University, had a great life. My license was taken away as well it should have been. Um, and socially, I remember when I would be out on a first date, and she would order a drink, and I would order a soda. The first day, oh, you don't drink? No, I have epilepsy. And drinking may induce a seizure, 
makes me tired, it's not good for me, so no, I don't drink. And what I tell people with epilepsy is, so what? Everybody's got something. And if the state has a problem with me having epilepsy, first of all, hello. <laughs> <laughs> but then you don't want her in your life anyway. So I would share it. So socially, um, and it did, but it did also get in my way because it was in my emotional portion of my brain. I lived with a wonderful woman for several years, but it dulled my capacity to feel love. And oh well, again, everybody's got something. From a business perspective, um, I started out in advertising until for 10 years I was in, working for large New York ad agencies. And then while having 20 seizures every month, I was, I started my own business. And I probably had to work longer, harder. I have a lot of the challenges that everyone else has. Um, well, I had more seizures than many. So my cognition, difficulty focusing, um, short-term memory, and so on. So I, I have, I'm smart, but I had trouble connecting the dots. So I had to work longer and harder and grew my company, which is now in its 30th year, into a large successful media company for the travel industry. I would still have seizures before my surgery. I would have be on the phone with somebody and have a seizure without realizing it impulsively just hung up. And post will come back and realize, oh, okay, I just had a seizure. I don't know who I was talking to. Hit redial. Hi, it's Richie, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hang up on you, I just had a seizure, I have epilepsy, what were we talking about? And you know, even today, now that, and I would have seizures at trade shows or in front of clients, so what? And one thing I would get across to everybody is, I think other people find it strong. It's not, it doesn't identify who I am, but to, to not make a big deal of it, people find that, wow, how cool. And so I think we, I know we can accomplish anything despite it. We may have to work longer, harder, but we can do it. And even today, my short term memory and ability to focus is not as great as it could be. So if I'm in a business meeting and I see myself starting to jump around a little bit, I'll say to them, you know, I'm sorry, I have a history of seizures. I tend to interrupt so that I don't forget my train of thought or I'll jump around and then move on. So look, that's how I compensated. And again, so what? Everyone's got something. This is all we have and we make the most of today. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. And we'll ask uh, Barb to give her introduction. Uh, good afternoon. I was going to say good morning, but it is afternoon. My name is Barb Capucci. Um, my uh, journey with epilepsy started at the age of 12 um, on the onset of my first day of my menses. Um, and uh, so I have a, a type of epilepsy which is sensitive to my hormones. And um, it has uh, the majority of my. Um, seizure activity occurred early on in my um, life, between my teen years, um, probably through my mid-twenties. And um, a lot of that activity, um, while it did not define my life, um, it definitely was there in the background. And um, then it became, I became seizure-free. Um, for a time period. And now while I'm entering a new season of my life, um, <coughs> my seizure activity has increased again. So my um, seizure journey continues, so, or my epileptic um, journey continues now. Um, so my seizure activity has been um, uh, characterized by uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures um, my entire life. And I've navigated this um, pretty much <coughs> similar to Rich, um, and it has not defined my life. 
um, but again, it has just been in my background. And I have really just sort of invited it to just be a part of my life. Um, and just to be, um, just to give you some examples, um, I've continued on, I went off to college and my parents would said to me, how can you go off and live off to college? You have epilepsy, you need to stay home, you need to stay close to us. Not only did I go off to college, but I said to my parents, but I'm gonna go study abroad as well. And they said, no, you definitely cannot do that. And I said, but I can, and so I did. Um, and then when I came back, I just continued um, defining my life and bringing the epilepsy along with me. Um, when I did not drive at first, but eventually I did drive within a mile radius of my home and then a two mile radius of my home, just very carefully and um, often with a lot of anxiety, but very carefully and, um, you know, little by little um, made some strides. So I had some freedom there, but it wasn't with a lot of um, anxiousness, not only on my part, but on my husband's part. Um, and so I can tell you that there isn't just, um, this journey did not happen alone. It happened with my whole family. So this was, um, a journey that uh, really encompassed people that I had to really take into account. My children, when I then became, uh, when I wanted to have children, I was very fortunate to be in that position to have children. Um, I became a part of this wonderful organization called FACES, who guided me along on that journey when that time came. And, uh, you know, I was able to meet Dr. Dubinsky and he was able to help me through that process. So there's a lot of um, helpful ways that we can um, support one another throughout this journey. And, um, and I was just blessed to be able to partake in, in all of that. So um, I too um, am very careful about taking care of myself in many ways. Um, incorporating things like meditation and yoga, um, you know, going for daily walks. I have a pet. Don't underestimate that those pets in our lives, you know, um, in addition because they help, you know, mitigate the things that our children, the blessings that our children bring, as well as the other things that our children bring into our lives um, and our partners. Um, there's a lot of things here that, that I can discuss. You know, I do have um, a job. I went back for a set, for two master's degrees late in my life. Um, there's a lot of things that, that I can discuss here um, in reference to employment and you know potential stigma and discrimination and, and things like that. So, um, but I'm happy to be here and, and share with all of you. So thank you for coming today. For um, you know, for sharing your stories, um, maybe I'll start with you, Barb, and because uh, you mentioned it, um, can you recall the decision-making process that went through when you were first, you know, thinking about having children, and you know, perhaps you know some of the things you you heard and were told, and and some of the misconceptions you might have encountered along the way, and or even you know the risks you had to take. Um, sure. So first, um, I was very um, fearful of having seizures. Uh, uh, first, I didn't know how to get pregnant. Second of all, I didn't, you know, I, I thought about, well, if I got pregnant, what if I had seizures while, while I was pregnant? And even if I was fortunate to have a baby, what if I had seizures after I had the baby? Um, all these thoughts ruminated through my head. Um, and caretaking for young children. You know, a lot a lot of um, thoughts, you know, occurred during that time frame. The other thing was just in the process of becoming um, pregnant was in reference to the medications that I was on. 
and what would this do to the fetus of my child? Would I have a normal child? Would I be able to have um, you know, a child without any birth defects? Would I have, be able to have a normal delivery? Um, there were so many questions that were just running through my head in reference to all of that at the time um, that I was incredibly fortunate not only to have one, but two, but three relatively healthy children. I, I did not, they did not all come out um, unscathed, I will say that. Um, my son was born with something called Pierre Robin syndrome, which is a, a cleft palate. Um, and uh, which he's, if you looked at him today, he's fine. Um, my daughter had some spinal um, issues. If you looked at her today, she's fine. Um, my children are grown adults today. Um, they are blessings. So, but they uh, really, it is, uh, um, it, there was a lot, of, a lot going through my head. And those are just some of the some of the tips of the iceberg. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, those are obviously important things. Thinking out for consideration when thinking about you know family planning. Um, Richard, maybe the next question uh, for you, uh, if you recall back to having you know active seizures uh, in your twenties, you mentioned a little bit about dating. Well, what about uh, just your um, your family and your friends. How did the, you know? How did how did your you know? How did your epilepsy interact in, affect your relationships with family and friends? I never hid that I had <coughs> epilepsy. So, um, my the best medicine is family. Uh, it beats any drug or surgery. And I was fortunate to have very 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 supportive parents. Um, when I first started with my seizures in my 20s, um, and I still I had a little bit of denial, and I think some denial was healthy. Uh, I would go out, and this was before Uber and before cell phones, I'm old. And um, my folks would drive me, we're out on Long Island, they would, you know, drive me everywhere without ever hinting a complaint. Um, Friends, it didn't, it, epilepsy, it's, you control epilepsy, it doesn't control you. So never hide it, and so what? In business, I remember working for an ad agency and um, needing to go to New Jersey to see a client. And this would have been in the 80s. Um, I either, initially, I took it upon myself to rent a car, uh, to get a car service. I didn't want to be a burden. And then in retrospect, I should have immediately said, I'm not allowed to drive. Um, and then ultimately, yeah, they would, the agency would have a different person come with me to drive. Um, it's not a big, some seizure activity, of course, can, for some people it is a huge deal. I probably had it more than most, again, 20 every month complex partial, some generalized, took good care of myself, which is very important. I got plenty of sleep. I still do get plenty of sleep. Something I want to touch upon is <clears throat> running. Um, I am a marathoner now, four faces. This will be my 10th New York City marathon. If you're able to run, do it. It's great, it's, it's great therapy. It's soothing, it brings you down. And running, nobody likes running. Nobody's born a runner, nobody likes running. But once you get into it, it's, like, I'm here, I was gonna run here, but it's raining. Mm -hmm. But, you know, get into running. If, if the doc says it's okay, because maybe hyperventilation or breathing heavy may induce a seizure. But, and athletics, I was very athletic while having all the seizure activity. I was still skiing. Um, I would do things that it was my choice to put myself at risk, but I wouldn't do anything to put other people at risk. Um, so it wasn't difficult to navigate friendships. 
um, or relationships, but my challenge was it dulled my emotions, so I, I didn't have the full capacity to feel as much love as I would have liked. Um, and that's my only regret having had epilepsy, but I'm very blessed and fortunate. Thank you, Richard. So, Alexander, um, maybe uh, you could speak to a little bit about what it was like, if you recall, being in college, you know, right at the time of this uh, epilepsy diagnosis and how you navigated academics, how you navigated socializing, dating, intimacy, if you, if you recall that. Uh, so, like I said, um, my first seizure was first night <laughs> of freshman orientation. Um, I had actually been on campus. I started college at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. Um, and I actually had been on campus for about three days. Um, I was still with my mom and my and some other students that um, were also there for pre-orientation. The pre-orientation was um, on or was for students with disabilities and medical conditions. Um, so I was already getting oriented, um, meeting friends, so forth. Um, when I when I had my first seizure, um, I was in a cafeteria, a room full of Ton of, tons of people, me, I was meeting new friends. Um, unbeknownst to me, the people that saw me have my first seizure are my best friends these, this, to this day. Um, so, you know, having had that seizure while, the first seizure, while it was really scary um, and not knowing what people would think of me, um, it turned out to be okay. Um, but after getting my first, or after having my first seizure, um, I still talk about it, I have regular anxiety attacks. Um, but there was a lot of anxiety, and so my ability to go to class, take a full course load of six courses, was not gonna be possible. Um, so one thing that I did to um, navigate taking care of myself and then my academics was um, going part-time. Um, it turned out not, Wheaton turned out not to be the best school for me. Um, I was away from home. I was away from Dr. Davinsky. I was from, you know, so I needed to move back home. So I finished up at Marymount Manhattan College. Um, but, you know, in terms of academics, um, I just, I've always taken a reduced course load. So that has helped me take care of myself. Um, but then it's also allowed me to have um, social relations, I mean, friendships. Um, and, you know, I'm not out partying every night. I don't drink, I don't, you know, any of that. But um, I think that was the biggest um, factor um, and biggest thing that I was fortunate um, to do. So I do recommend reduced course loads or also a reduced um, work environment, you know, part time. Um, but, you know, with all of that said, you know, I've, you know, I've had people be like, you know, Richie say, well, okay, you, you have epilepsy, I'm scared, like, whatever. But then you have a bunch of group of people that could not really care. Like Richie said, like, we all have something. Um, and those that are going to um, want to embrace you are going to embrace you and not care about the diagnosis. Um, and those that do want to, you know, um, take you out and, you know, you know, bully you or so forth, well, they're not the right people to be around. Um, so throughout college, I had a great group of friends. Um, I found my friends um, and, you know, was surrounded by the people that really, um, you know, wanted to be with me and I knew wanted to be with them. It wanted to, you know, wanted to be with them. Um, when it comes to romantic relationships and intimacy, um, it's very interesting because disclosing that you have a disability in and of itself, epilepsy, um, is really scary. Um, I will say my, my third seizure, I was out on a date, had a seizure. Really scary. It was during Hurricane Sandy. Um, not the best <laughs> um, way to have my first date. Obviously, the guy was very sympathetic and um, so forth. Um, but, you know, I, the way I approach it, um, I'm dating, I'm not in a relationship or anything, but I go about, you know, 
saying that I don't drink, um, you know, I work part time, you know, just like I'm a normal girl, just doing things that, you know, some people don't do, such as drinking or working full time. Um, and I don't really, and you know, I let the relationship and the date and all of that progress. Um, and when it comes to a time where I feel like it needs to be disclosed, I disclose it. Um, it's never been an issue. People are like, oh, that's, that's okay. There's so many people, you know, I've dated a person with epilepsy, you know, my sister has autism, a wide range of things. Um, the one thing that is sometimes of question, um, and I've had to face it um, head on is intimacy um, because men, some men think that, oh no, like are you gonna have a seizure during intimacy? And, you know, I just basically say no. And, you know, it's up to them to feel, um, uh, to feel confident um, or not confident. If they're not confident, they're not right for you. Um, so that's a little bit about intimacy and college and friendships. <laughs> um, that's great. I want to I want to um, save some time, and, you know, because I'm sure uh, people in the audience have other questions, uh, having heard a little bit about you. I, I just want to maybe go back to uh, one question, the one issue that um, uh, for Richard, um, you know, you made the decision to go ahead and have epilepsy surgery uh, when you were an adult, when you were, you know, had an established career, uh, you had potential, you know, to, you know, lose some of the things that made you successful in that aspect of life. Well, do you, do you remember the thinking around that process? Yeah, I do. So again, <clears throat> as many of you know, 10% of the people with epilepsy are candidates for surgery. To be a candidate has to be a safe place in the brain to get at. It can't be generalized seizures because that's the entire brain. So 10% of us are. Um, I The concept of brain surgery to me was no, not me, that's somebody else, not me, which ultimately you know, is a very selfish way to look at it. So Dr. Davinsky had said to me that no medicine was going to control my seizures. They were going to get worse. They were in the emotional portion of my brain. And one of the things that I articulated to him that I was concerned about is, well, I don't want a scar. And I remember him saying to me, if you're concerned about a little white line on the side of your head, you've got bigger issues than epilepsy. <laughs> and that's when it dawned on me that, you know, maybe I'm not thinking as clearly as I could or should. And I left his office and I went to my girlfriend at the time and I hugged her and I said, I'm going to have to do this. It's a matter of which, excuse me, sucks less epilepsy or brain surgery. Found out that I was, so. Again, we only have this one time. I wanted. To, I didn't want to look back and think I should have. And with surgery, so if you're a candidate, um, you'll go through two weeks of inpatient testing to ter determine if you are a candidate. And then Dr. Doyle, who is the number one epilepsy doctor in the world, and I love the man, so he looked at my case and said to me, gave me the numbers. 10% of people with epilepsy die from pseudo. So I knew that going in. I had less than a one less than a one half of one percent chance of dying on the table. So that's good on, um, initially. Um, I had roughly a twenty percent chance of seizure freedom, seventy percent chance of reduced seizures, twenty percent chance of maybe more frequent seizures. So to me, it was, again, which thinks less, and for whatever reason, I, um, I got the blessing, completely cured, no side effects. I used to be a woman, no side effects, <laughs> and never felt better. I'm very appreciative, and uh, if anyone wants to learn more about that, I'm happy to share it with you. And then uh, maybe the last, my last question, then we'll bring up the, uh, the audience uh, question for Barb. You, you brought up, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues in the workplace and you know potential discrimination in uh, in the workplace without any necessarily specifics. If you're not comfortable doing that, but maybe uh, tell a little, uh, tell us a little bit how you you face what challenges you might have faced and how you uh, how you address them. 
Thanks for the question. Um, so first of all, I just want to jump back to um, one of the initial question that you had asked me just to say one thing. Um, and that is that um, I had some genetic counseling done in reference to some of the um, concerns that my children were born with. And there was no tie to what my children were born with in regards to my epilepsy. So I just want to put that out there just in case anyone is having or is um, considering um, having children. So I just want to put that out there. Um, in any event, um, definitely stigma um, is one of the, um, whether that was perceived or real in, in the workplace, um, that was one, one thing. Um, that I had to deal with. And um, let, me, let me say one thing. So um, I'll give you some of the environments that I worked in. So when I first um, entered the workplace, um, I had worked for two Fortune 500 companies um, in international sales and um, customer service, and then I went to international banking. Um, so those were my uh, first, that was my, those were my first career paths um, when I entered the workforce. Um, and then I was in uh, some biotech companies. And then I went to nonprofits, and then higher education, and now I'm in the education arena. So, um, uh, and I took some time off um, in between the, the um, biotech and the nonprofits um, to stay home with my children. In the, um, with the Fortune 500 companies, I think that that was probably the arena where um, I was most faced with, uh, and this was a different time and place. Um, I think that times right now are a little bit more conducive to, um, and I could be wrong, but um, they're a little bit more conducive or open, depending upon your environment, um, to, um, individuals uh, who have more diverse needs in the workplace. Um, but it also depends upon your comfort level um, in your in your situation. Um, I'm talking, this was 25, 30 years ago. Um, so at that point in time, it was a little bit different um, when I was uh, sharing some of my concerns. Um, and the individuals that I was working with um, perhaps weren't as um, amicable to my needs um, in regards to um, what I needed, um, or if I was a little bit slower um, in processing or in my duties of my job or, or things like that. So, um, so. I think you really have to read who you're working with, who you're working for, the environment that you're in, um, and, and things of that nature. And, and so I've come, I've, I've had to read that along the way um, and in the environments that I've been. So, and obviously the job duties. I found over the years, the way that you serve it up is the way other people will take it. So if you don't make a big deal of it, if it's not, or an issue for you, let them know it's not. And again, the way that you serve it up is the way other people will take it. Um, that's um, all right, so in the last few minutes, uh, is any, uh, any question for the panelists or? or uh, this is for Richie. Can you speak up to, oh, or do you want a microphone? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So post-surgery, are you on medication, seizure medication? Thank you. I am on a tiny bit of trileptal right now. Well, two things post-surgery to share. One, tiny bit of trileptal, but that uh, it's probably 5% of what I had been on before. But it's not for seizure control. One of the things that happened with me, and it varies by person, is um, because of where they were touching, depression. And I take medicine for that. And um, the trileptal is also a mood stabilizer. So that's why I'm taking a tiny bit of trileptal, but um, a, a minuscule. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, the law is an anti seizure med, but it's for mood. It also, one of the byproducts is mood stabilizer. So I, I, that's all I, I take. Over there? Yes. Well, uh, um, my alumni are out of the Syracuse. When Syracuse, I was like, yes, yeah, Syracuse. I was like, yes, yeah, Syracuse. I was like, yes, yeah, Syracuse. Um, you, uh, what year did you um, have the surgery? Surgery. For the, um, surgery was 19 years ago, uh, April 16th, and um, no seizures. The only byproduct post-surgery was, um, so it was a total of two weeks in the hospital, flat on my back at home for about three weeks, and then slowly getting back into it. There was post-surgery depression, which my understanding is not uncommon, but it goes away eventually or is treated. And in my case, had I not had the surgery, with the amount of seizure activity that I was having, I would have exceeded that level of depression or any other issues um, over time. So you wasn't given the choice of brain surgery and the brain, or the base nerve stimulator? Um, VNS will, I was a good candidate for the surgery. Uh -huh. VNS is typically for people who are not candidates for surgery. Mm -hmm. So if that's up to you and the neurologist and neurosurgeon, for my, my case, surgery was the best option and uh, I think they were right. <laughs> I had to wait uh, a year. Legally, I had to wait a year to be seizure free. Um, and then, and I drove prior to my epilepsy, waited a year to become seizure free, then had to take driver's ed again, and then had to take a test, my driver's test, and they told, they told me after I finished the test that I passed. And I said to the tester, I said, you know, in all your years of doing this, I don't think you've made anybody happier then you have me telling me that I just passed. So uh, I did have to wait a year, and um, yes, I, I drive now. Yeah. Hi, can you That's a really interesting question. Um, I I don't think it's choose your battles. Um, you know, when it comes to bullying, for me especially, it was when I was younger. So it actually was really prior to my seizures. Um, and, you know, it was that they, they, they didn't know, for instance, that I, you know, they didn't understand, let's put it that way. You know, oh, I was, you know, I was, getting out of class early, going to do some, you know, going to a support group. Um, or, you know, my right arm was a little bit postured due to the physical limitations. Um, so I think it was really a lack of knowledge um, and honest and understanding. When I got to college, they could give a frack. Like, everyone has something. We love you, Allie, and that's all that matters. Um, but when it comes to, I guess, um, choose your battles, you know, I would say, you know, forgiveness. There's tons of people in this world, like Rich says, everyone's got something. It could, it's epilepsy, it could be financial issues, it could be, you know, I mean, the list goes on, I'm not gonna say <laughs> every single thing. Um, and you're gonna find the niche of people that wanna be with you and vice versa. And those that don't want are like gonna criticize you and bully you, well, they're just not, they're not worth it. Like, don't spend your time, life is too short. Okay, one last question. Mr. Bart, um, did you disclose at all times with the jobs? Then were you discriminated against at that point? Um, so, I did disclose um, to my first employer, the first Fortune 500 company, um, and yes, I do believe that I was discriminated against. 
um, I was offered, um, I was asked to leave. Um, I was offered another job at another location. Um, so I did, I did end up leaving. Um, that is, uh, I was working outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the time. Um, so I left that, uh, I left that employer and that's when I went to work for the biotech company. When I went to work, when I went to work for the biotech company, which was in Boston, in the Boston area, um, I did not disclose. Um, I worked for them for approximately four and a half years. I never disclosed to them um, at any point in time. Um, I never had a reason to disclose. It um, did not affect my performance at any point in time. When I then joined the next Fortune 500 company, which was in the city um, at the World Trade Centers, it did um, impact my, uh, a, I was offered a, um, this, this was the occurring at the exact same time that I had my um, first pregnancy. And this was occurring at the exact time that I was also being talked about a promotion. So um, when I disclosed that I was pregnant as well as the promotion came through, um, they then backpedaled on the promotion. So I don't know if um, I then disclosed also my epilepsy. I don't know which was the promotion ever came through. I don't know whatever, which one it was. I cannot ascertain. What, so I ask, what, what was the reason for dismissal in the first job? What, did it, what reason did they give you for dismissal? Uh, they didn't dismiss me. They offered me another position okay. at another location. Got it. So I ended up leaving. All right, we have to uh, go on to the, uh, the next session, but I really, really, truly thank, thank you. Uh, stories and uh, hopefully um, people in the audience found it.